And I have a need. I call on this woman to pray because I know she prays. And uh, thank God for your ministry, your husband's ministry. And would you just reach your hands this way and bless her, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, we just lift up Melissa. I thank you, Lord, for a woman who stands in the gap. Lord, I thank you for a teacher of the gospel, a preacher of the gospel. And I praise you for the word that she's going to bring to us this morning. And I pray your anointing and your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. All right, so Pastor always starts out with a joke, and I am just not a joke person. I butcher it. I don't know if it's just my dry sense of humor or what, but so I'm not going to start with a joke. I'm going to start with something just that happened this morning. You know, I've told you before, I love to worship the Lord, and when I get in my bathroom, especially on Sunday mornings, that's my time. And um, my husband, I miss him dearly, but I was not having to sneak around the corner to make sure that he didn't have a video camera sitting there. Um, he loves to film me, and he loves it to send it to the entire praise team because he knows that I can't sing. But this morning, I'm singing, and I'm worshiping at the top of my lungs. You know, I'm just loving, oh, my God, my Savior. And I'm getting prepared. I'm getting ready. I'm getting my spirit stirred. And during intermission, you know, because I'm performing a concert, so during intermission, I hollered at Madison, and I said, the concert's free, by the way, but feel free to tip me if you would like. She said, no, I would rather not. She, and on the way to church, she said, I am so surprised that our windows did not bust this morning from your singing. So, yes, I have been in the presence of God today already. But, you know, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank the musicians. I want to thank to see you. Everything this morning has just went exactly with what I plan to speak about. So that's not only confirmation, but it tells me that you guys have been listening to the voice of God and that you're in tune, and I'm so thankful for that. What I want to talk to you about is Samson. My Sunday school class just got through doing a whole study on the book of Judges. And so when we got towards the end, of course, we were studying Samson, and we were all talking about how Samson is just a particular guy and how it's kind of puzzling, really, but God would not let me get away from Samson. And so as I began to study and as I began to prepare, because I knew that Pastor Coomer would wait till this week to ask me to preach. So I started studying last week. I'm like, God, I'm going to be ready. If he asks me, that's great. If he don't, that's okay. So I started studying. I want to talk to you today about Samson. But as Pastor says, it's not about Samson. It's really about us. It's really about how we can relate to that. So I want you to turn to your Bibles, if you have them, to Judges 13. We are going to read 1 through 5, and then we're going to skip over and we're going to do 24 and 25. All right, so Judges 13, 1 through 5 says, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Skip to verse 24 and 25. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtael. I want to give you just a little bit of background. Most of you know that there was a cycle. It says, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So basically, over and over and over, the children of Israel would sin. They would transgress. They would backslide against the Lord and against his commandments. So what would happen? Because of the evil that they had done, they would be oppressed by their sin. God would send someone that would enslave them, that would impress them oppress them, not impress them, that would oppress them. And what would they do because of that? 
they would cry out to God. They would ask God, send someone, help us. So God would be so merciful. He would be so compassionate because God is a good God, because God is a just God, because he is moved with compassion for you when you cry out to him. He sent a deliverer. He sent a deliverer. He sent Samson, and Samson was going to begin, get it, he was going to begin to deliver Israel. This time was going to be the longest oppression that the children of Israel had ever had to endure. This time they had to face 40 years, 40 years of oppression because of their sins. But I want you to think about it. It said that God sent a deliverer. Who did he send it to? He sent it to a barren lady, a barren lady. Only God, only God can call life out of darkness. Only God can bring forth hope into a hopeless situation. Only God can do that. It's not just a coincidence that God chose a barren womb to fulfill his divine purpose. All you have to be is an empty vessel. All you have to be is someone that's willing and open that will say, God, here I am. God, use me. You know, a couple years ago, you could have never told me that I would stand before you and bring the word of God. But my heart's cry has always been, God, use me. God, mold me. God, make me into what you would have me to be. The song, The Potter's Will, that's always been my prayer, always. And God honors that when you're wanting to be used by him. Verse 3 says, I have to have my glasses. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said, Indeed, now you are barren, but you will conceive. Think about that. That describes my life perfectly before Christ. This lady was barren until she had an encounter with Jesus. And once she had that encounter, she was never the same again. Her life was changed. I was barren. I was dead. I was dry. I was hopeless. I was living for the world until I had that one encounter with Jesus Christ, and that one encounter was all I needed. And I love verse 24 and 25, because 24 and 25 tells me that if God has made a promise to you, you better hang on. It may not be in His timing, I'm sorry, your timing, but it's in His. And it tells me that He is going to bring it to pass, that He cannot lie. And what He says, He will accomplish it. Hold on. Wait for it. Don't give up. So many times we are so impatient that if it doesn't happen right when we expect it to, we think it's never going to happen. But God is faithful. He won't forget those promises that he's made to you. The Spirit of the Lord was working powerfully in Samson's life. I want you to think about it. There was such a big contrast between Samson's divine strengths, because we all know Samson had this mighty strength that came from the Lord, and his carnal weaknesses. If I talked to you about his strengths, you would know that Samson killed a lion with what? His bare hands. You would know that he killed 30 Philistines, that he slew a thousand men with just a donkey's jawbone donkey's jawbone, that he captured 300 foxes or jackal and tied them together. Such amazing strength. But it's not the strength that I want to talk to you about today. It's his weaknesses and how we can actually relate to those. Number six, one through eight, is a little bit of background about Samson because the first thing that you have to know how Samson relates is he was called and he was chosen just like we are called and chosen. So number six, one through eight. I feel like this mic is, is it buzzing or is it me? Okay, I'm good. All right. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink he shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. 
Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. So let me tell you, first of all, it was a Nazarite vow. It means to be separate, to be set apart, to be used by God. So he was chosen. He was called just like we are chosen and called. Normally, it was a voluntarily vow that they would take. But Samson's was different. Samson's was called by God. Remember I said earlier that he had the Lord's favor. And normally, they would last anywhere from 30 to 100 days, but not Samson's. It was different. It was going to be from the time that he was in his mother's womb to his death. So his whole life, he was to be set apart for God. Samson had tremendous potential. He had the Lord's favor. But he stands as a warning to us of the dangers of worldliness, of the dangers of compromise. You know, so many times as Christians, we're willing to compromise. We're willing to just let go of our moral standards because there's something that we want to do, some place we want to go, something we want to visit, something that we want to partake of that we know we have no business doing. But the greater part of this is, not only was he a reminder of that, but he was a reminder to us, to the church, that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is greater than any and all of our sin. God designed for us is so much like his design for Samson. First of all, God loved us before we ever knew him. Before we were in our mother's womb, just like Samson, he knew us. He called us out of darkness and into his glorious light. He chose us. He calls us into ministry. Not only does he call us, but he equips us. He longs for us to be holy, to be undefiled, to be set apart for His glory. I want to read to you Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to His good pleasure of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Young people especially, do you ever feel like you have to fit in? Do you ever feel like you have to try to be somebody that you're not because you're afraid to let that light shine? Are you afraid that you won't feel accepted? Well, this verse tells me that God made us accepted. He made us fit. He made us belong. We don't have to try to be like the world. Quite the opposite. We need to be different. We need to let our light shine so that others can see that. And what? The Bible says that they will glorify God. They will turn to Him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First of all, it tells us don't be conformed. The world wants to change you. It wants to mold you. It wants to rob you of your joy, your peace, and your happiness. Why? Because Satan has a target on your back. He wants to try to kill, to steal, and destroy everything, everything that you have worked for. God set you apart for a purpose. He has a plan for your life. He has something that only you can fulfill. Only you can do. And Satan wants to rob you from that. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. It says that is your, whole, that is your acceptable service to God. To try to live a holy life. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, I love this verse, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
who once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. There's a reason to rejoice in that. I'm His. I am His. I am His. I'm chosen. He loves me. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing worthy about me. But because God bought me, because He redeemed me, because He saves me, I can go forth in power and in boldness and proclaim the love of God to everyone that I meet. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Come out from among them and be separate. What is it telling you to come out from among? Come out from among the world. Don't try to fit in. So many times we try to walk into a room and we just want to walk right in the middle. We don't want no one to notice us. We don't want to stand out. We just want to kind of blend. But we weren't called to do that. We were called to be different. We were called to walk into a room and change the whole atmosphere of that room just because you're there. Just because your presence is in that place. You are chosen, you are called, you are forgiven, you are loved, you are accepted, you are a child of the King. Royal blood flows through your veins. If you think about this for a minute, Jesus Christ died for you. He gave it all. He sacrificed every single thing that He had so that we should be dedicated to live in a holy life dedicated to his divine purpose. I feel like living a holy life is the tiniest little bit of sacrifice that I can do. That's the smallest thing that I can do. But what did he die for? He died to deliver you from sin. He died to deliver you from the pits of hell. He died to deliver you from bondage. He died to deliver you from this world. So don't go and be enslaved once again by the world. Don't go and be tied to it or be slaved by sin. Sin is death. You know, if you picture someone and they're walking down the road and they're carrying all this baggage, they're carrying all this luggage, they're carrying around so many burdens, they can't be the mighty warrior that God has called them to be. But once you accept salvation, once you accept freedom, once you accept deliverance, you're trading all that in. You're giving God your past. You're giving God your baggage. You're giving God your luggage. That way you can truly be free. That way you can have peace. That way you can have hope. That way you can have joy. You know, I want to tell you about something. With sin, there's no black and white areas. I'm sorry, there's no gray areas. It's only black and white. I recently talked to a friend of mine and she does meal plans. And so I sent her a text and I said, okay, give me some information. So she comes back and she's like, what information do you want? She's wanting me to tell her exactly what I want. I said, I want some information on your meal plans. Are they free? That was my question. Or do I have to pay? What's the cost? What I should have asked was, what's it going to cost me? She sent me this meal plan. And when she sent it, the first paragraph was, the first week is hard. The first week, most people quit. She said, the very first week is a cleansing. She said, you have to follow this to a T. She said, if I say 13 almonds, you eat 13 almonds. Don't eat 14, don't eat 12. She said, if I say you eat four ounces of meat, you eat four ounces of meat. And it was strict. What did I do? I didn't do it. I didn't even start it. I looked at it. I read it. I deleted the email. So... She, I'm being honest, she asked me later in the week, she said, how did it go with the diet? And I told her, I said, I didn't do it. And her words to me were, there's no gray areas with this plan. There's no room for error with this plan. She said, it's strictly black and white. When you get serious, call me and I'll be here. And I said, whew, that was a sting. But it's true. It's so very true. And that's the way that life is. You know, first we got to cleanse ourselves. First we got to purify ourselves. We got to get rid of any unrighteousness that's in us because it defiles us. It holds us back and it keeps us from being everything that God has called us to be. And then we have to be serious. We have to be dedicated to the calling of God. And she knew 
I wasn't ready to sacrifice. I wasn't ready to let go. I wasn't ready to give up my coffee. And I wasn't ready to give up my creamer. And that wasn't on this plan. So, all right. So think about it. When are you going to give 100%? When are you going to let go of whatever it is that prevents you from serving God or ensnares you or entangles you? Because it holds us back. Samson was tempted. Judges 14, 1 through 3. Let me get there real quick. I took my bookmark out. Judges 14, 1 through 3. Now Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said to his father, Get her for me. For she pleases me well. Samson had a weakness. Not only was he called and he was chosen by God, but he had a weakness for women. He was tempted. Um, not only was he wanting this lady because she pleased him, he was willing to do anything and everything to get her. He was willing to disobey God. He was willing to disobey his parents. He was willing to just give up or let go of his Nazarite vow simply because he wanted what the world had to offer. If you think about it for a minute, what does the world offer you? It's fleeting happiness. It's pleasure for just a moment. So his parents begged him, do not marry with this Philistine lady. Is there not someone in our clan, in our family, that you can marry? Because they knew that marrying her would be a denial of his Nazarite vow. But she pleased him. He had to have her at all costs. Samson got too familiar with sin. He got too familiar with the Philistines. Too familiar with the enemy. Are you so familiar with sin that it doesn't even bother you anymore? Are you so familiar with cussing that you just allow those words to roll off your tongue and you don't even take notice of what you've said? Are you so familiar with going to a bar and sitting down and having a beer that it doesn't even bother you anymore? We get to a point where we've got to shake ourselves and see where we're at with God. Samson was just like the world. He was constantly searching for that next thrill, that next high, that next thing that was going to bring him pleasure. But he didn't realize that only God could satisfy. Only God could satisfy his and our needs. What stands between you and God? What is causing you to lose your sight of the plans that God has for you? Are you willing to risk eternity for it? Are you willing to trade your salvation for that little tiny, tiny fox that spoils the vine? Judges 14, 5 through 9 says, So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother, and he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands, and he went along eating. When he came to his father and his mother, he gave some to them, and they ate also. He did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. We know as a Nazarite, he was supposed to remain separate from corpses, but he was tempted once again, not just to get closer to that corpse, not just to move a little bit closer into that enemy territory, but to actually reach in, scoop down, touch that corpse, and get some of the honey, and he ate of it. Then what did he do? He gave it to his mother and his father. So he not only defiled himself, but he defiled his parents because they ate not knowing the source of that honey. 
Sin, like Pastor says, and I butcher it every single time, but it will take you further you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And I think that's the first time I got it right. Carolyn's nodding. (laughs) But it's true. Sin will enslave you, and it doesn't just destroy you. Sin destroys your family. And we have a family member right now that his marriage is destroyed because of sin. He's lost his children because of sin. He's about to find himself 20 days in jail because of sin. But you know what? God can take that situation and He can use it for His good. Because what we're praying is that 20 days in that jail, God's going to open His spiritual eyes. He's going to be able to see for the first time in His life. And He's going to change. But I want you to notice verse 5. The location. Where was He at? He was in the vineyards of Timnah. Was that not a strange location for someone that is supposed to avoid the vine at all costs? Such a strange location. You know what it tells me as a child of God? That there are some places that we have absolutely no business going. Because there are temptations around every single corner that are ready to just slap you right in the face. But especially when you set yourself up for it. When you walk into enemy tem- enemy enemy territory, you are going to be tempted like never before. So there are some places that we can't go. Satan knows your weaknesses. He knows what it takes to push those buttons. He knows what your struggle is because you face a different struggle than I face. And each and every single one of us have things that we have to face. I'm not going to go into the rest of his temptations, but I want to start reading to you James 1, 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one, listen to this, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. By his own desires, we are tempted and enticed. Then, when desire has been conceived, it brings birth to sin. And sin, when it is full gone, brings forth death. Lynn has a picture that I want to show you, not just because I'm missing my husband, but because it's a perfect example of sin. You think about this fish. This fish was there, it was swimming around that pond, minding its own business. And what did it see? To me, it saw a disgusting, nasty worm that just gives me shivers. But to it, it saw something tasty. It saw something appetizing. It saw something that it wanted to have. Something that was going to bring it pleasure. So it got a little bit closer. Got a little bit closer. Then it got just a little bit closer. Until finally, it just had to have that worm and it latched on. But that worm is what lured it to its death and up out of those waters. Sin does the same thing. Sin looks appealing. Sin looks pleasing, but the moment that you act on that sin and it becomes full grown, it's going to produce death in your spiritual life. It's going to separate you from God. How to defeat temptation. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of its might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. What I say to that is know your weaknesses. Know what tempts you. So you can recognize temptation when it comes. And you can pray and you can stop it dead in its tracks. But recognize who sends it. Who sends it. And go to battle. It is spiritual warfare at its finest. When Satan sends you temptation, you combat it with the word of God. As Christians, we've got a higher calling than just our pursuit of happiness. Samson traded everything for his happiness. His happiness. But us, our pursuit should be holiness. God knows that we're not going to be perfected until we're raptured home. Until we have that glorified body. And until then, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a battle every single day. It's going to be something that daily we have to crucify the flesh. It's a process. 
You know, I think my biggest temptation is when I'm driving in traffic. When I'm driving in traffic, I get irritated, I get anxious, I get impatient, and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. But Samson failed, and we have all failed. As Samson lived, he broke just about every single one of the Nazarite vows that was made on his behalf. But you know what's so great? Samson represents us. Samson was chosen for greatness. He was set apart for holiness, but he was defiled by his own sinful actions. But this is where it gets good. To me, this is where it gets good. But God, say it with me, but God. But God, but God can turn our human failures into his divine glories, victories. We fail, but God is still faithful. He never gives up on us. Samson was blinded. He was imprisoned. He was used as a slave, but God. But God was then, and God is still now, today, in the restoring business. So not only was he chosen, not only was he called, not only was he tempted and tested, not only did he fail, but the best part of the story is he was restored. Judges 16.22, however, however, there's always a however with God. However, the hair of his head began to grow after it had been shaven. That was a ray of hope. His hair represented his vow. His hair represented his strength. His hair represented his union, his relationship with God, that he was set apart. And it all came from God. Judges 16, 28 says, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. In the Old Testament times, when you say remember me, it wasn't just an act of saying, oh, I want you to remember who I am. It was saying, I want you, I need you to act on my behalf. So what he was doing once again was he was remembering his roots. He was remembering his godly heritage. He was remembering that he had been prophesied over from the time that he was in the womb, that he was set apart for greatness, and he was turning once again to God. He finally, finally was starting to surrender to God. Do you need to be restored today? So many people need restoration in so many different aspects of their life. This is the best part of this whole thing, and I'm getting pretty close to close. Hebrews 11, 32 through 34. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, who through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped mouths of lions, quenched a violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They became valiant in battle, and they turned to flight the armies of aliens. So even though we see Samson's life as a lot of ups and downs, a lot of temptations, a lot of failures, Samson still ended up in Hebrews. He still ended up in the faith chapter. This is the last scripture I'm going to read. Psalm 51, 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted to you. Aren't you glad that God looks past our weaknesses? He looks past our failures and He sees that mighty man, that mighty woman of God that He knows that you will be. His will will be done in you. His will will be done through you and it will be done despite you. Despite your fears, despite your failures, despite your complacency, God's will will be done in your life. Despite all the things that Samson done, because of his faith, he was recognized. He was recognized. What will you be known for? What will people remember you by? What will your legacy be? Some of you have to surrender your will in exchange for God's. God wrote the book. Samson's life wasn't over. 
there was still purpose for his life. And there still can be purpose for yours. You know, I just want to point out, I have a godson, and he's back there. He drove all the way from Atlanta to support me today. I met him at a low point in his life. Can I tell the story? I met him at QT. He was standing there, and he was just asking for a couple of dollars because at this time they were living in their van. I looked in his face and I saw brokenness. I looked in his eyes and there was no joy. There was no hope. There was no peace. But God started dealing with us and we started helping. But what God has done, I've seen restoration in his life. I've seen him happy. I look in his eyes now and I see a light (laughs) and I see joy. And you can't even begin to imagine how much that blesses me. It blesses me just to see that, that one act of love. You never know what your one act of love can do for someone. You know, he blesses my heart to come all the way up here. And he calls me his God mom. And you can never know what that means to me. But today, some of you are hurting. Today, some of you feel like you have failed God. You feel like you have let God down. You feel like you have not accomplished His purpose in your life. Maybe you're running from the Lord. Maybe you haven't surrendered your will. Maybe you've kind of gotten backslidden. Maybe you've kind of got your eyes off of God. So I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're just weak. Maybe you're just weary. Because let's face it, life is hard. Temptations are real. They're at every single corner. We're pulled by every direction, whether it's work, whether it's family, whether it's friends. It's hard. So what I want you to do is stand to your feet and as they are singing the song, these altars are open. No matter what you need from the Lord, God is good, God is faithful, God is just, and He will supply. We worship you, God. Have your way in this place today, God.